Hello folks, this is Nathan and we're in the Booth of Truth with yours truly, Nathan Conkey, a.k.a. Nathan Teacher, representing the uh, east of Belfast, Belfast, and we're narrating the entire works of R.J. Rushduni, if God spares me and gives me grace, together with the uh, team at uh, Grace Community School and Calcedon. So, um, yeah, we're in the book Our Threatened Freedom, a series of 155 radio broadcasts. And this I'm narrating the scripts thereof. So we're in section six. six. Yes, section six. Yeah, I can't click on it. Oh, there we go. Uh, and uh, section six and number three. Let's go. Three. Are sports becoming a threat to us? I've always enjoyed sports, and I can remember my excitement as a boy in watching my first big league game. As Americans, we are prone to delight in sports, but not to the extremes of some countries. For us, a game is a game. Fun, but not much more than that. Recently, however, there have been developments on the sports scene which may, in time, create an ugly backlash against these really good games. For some years, some basketball... Baseball. Base. Baseball. 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 For some years, some baseball, football, basketball and hockey teams have been provided with publicly owned facilities built specifically for them at the taxpayer's expense. Of the 80 stadiums and arenas housing the nearly 100 big league teams, according to Inquiry magazine, May 1980, about two-thirds were built at the taxpayer's expense. These stadiums and arenas are not only a tremendous expense to the taxpayer, but are often scandal-tainted in their construction. Their costs are astronomical, some are badly located and poorly constructed, and the main beneficiaries are the owners of the sports teams. These owners are already extremely wealthy, but we pay for their benefits a considerable bump up. Oh, no. They're wealthy, but we pay for their benefits a considerable amount. Hello. Really wealthy, but we pay for their benefits a considerable amount. But we pay for their benefits a considerable. A, but we pay for their benefit a considerable amount of taxes. But we pay for their benefits a considerable amount of taxes. If sports are entitled to public housing at the taxpayer's expense. Why not other activities? Why not provide free barber shops for all barbers, plush facilities for a modest rental fee? After all, virtually all males use barber shops, so they serve more people than do the big league sports. About 50 to 60 percent of all Americans go to church. Should we build churches with tax funds? Restaurants provide a very much needed public service and their costs are high and their life expectancy not too good. Should we subsidise restaurant construction and maintenance? Of course, the big league teams pay rent for the use of the stadiums and arenas. The amount is small, usually 5-6% to 6 of the gate receipts with the frequent condition that this payment is valid only after a minimum attendance figure is reached. Are you paying only 5-6% to 6 of your income for rents or house payments? Are you excused from payments if your income drops below a certain amount? Why, then, do we have to pay to provide housing for big league sports? I like sports. 
but not on my tax bill. In brief, the kinds of things our taxes now subsidise are not only ridiculous, but dangerous to our freedom. When the modest income taxpayer is subsidising housing for wealthy big league teams, something is seriously wrong and needs altering. Sports ball! Kick in the sports ball! Sports ball! Five. Are regulations costing too much? Recently, a man who operates a business told me that a considerable part of his time is spent filling out state and federal forms. I'm a bookkeeper for a bu- I'm a bookkeeper for the bureaucrats, he complained. I'm a bookkeeper for the bureaucrats, he complained. However, it's not only private citizens who make such complaints. Fred Hedinger, executive director of the Pennsylvania State School Board Association, has released an interesting bit of information. In 1979, the state of Pennsylvania got approximately 7.5 cents of its educational dollar from the federal government, but it cost the state 8 cents of that dollar to comply with the federal regulations and administer the funds. Capsule, November 1980, 14. Now, such an expense could be justified if education were improved by federal regulations. After all, it is unwise to reduce education to a matter of cost only. The results determine the value of the expenditures. However, the quality of education has declined as federal controls have increased. The experts in Washington feel that they have more knowledge and ability to provide quality education than the local school board. Congress and the bureaucracy have seized more and more control over education, supposedly to improve educational quality and opportunity. The result has instead been a steady decline in quality and in opportunity. The result has been a backlash taking three forms. First, a demand for more local control over state schools. Second, the growth and development of Christian schools all over the country. Third, the developments of various plans for home teaching. The unhappy fact is that Washington is not getting the message that regulations are costing too much in money, in manpower and wasted time, and in the destruction of quality. Moreover, what has happened in education has taken place elsewhere as well. Regulations are stifling the economy, personal freedoms and the quality of life generally. Like narcotic addicts, our society is becoming hooked on federal funds. Sports, arts and sciences, education, big business and more all look to Washington for handouts. The last thing many seem to want is freedom. An editorial in the capsule sums it up. A society that is hooked on federal funds is one that has totally debauched itself. Okay. Det, 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 detached. Is one that has totally detached itself from the ideologies of Christianity and has swallowed the humanistic funding fable hook, line, and sinker. Capsule, November 1980, 9. It's time for us to unhook ourselves. No one of us. No, 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 no. School teachers. School teachers. Come on. Five. What is a fumage? The word fumage is something you find only in an unabridged dictionary, 
but it deals with something very much a part of our world today. Taxation. Tyron states tax everything they can think of, and a new way of stripping people of their money is a delight to them. The old Turkish Empire, among other things, taxed trees. Shea trees were cut down and the hill stripped of trees to avoid extra taxation. The sultans also had a window tax. Houses were, as a result, built virtually windowless. A fumage was a tax from Anglo-Saxon England, a hearth tax, or literally, a tax on smoke. I am rather afraid to talk about the fumage, lest some state legislators get ideas about another source of taxation. Every fireplace and cooking hearth, however primitive, was taxed by the king. Tax... down. Taxation is a very interesting, as well as ugly, fact. Every country in history has moved, step by step, towards increasing taxes, until finally the burden of taxation grows so great that the people rebel, the civil government collapses, and a new civil order has begun. Then the same old process begins, sometimes very early. The French Revolution protested against the king's taxes and rule, only to increase the taxes upon gaining power and to overrule in new and unprecedented ways. Has any country reversed the destructive course of taxation without bloodshed? Here the record is very bleak indeed. Taxation has always been like a cancer. It grows and spreads until it destroys the entire body politic. Is there, then, no hope? 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 Are we doomed to seeing taxation increase until we are economically destroyed and the nation collapses? Well, one ray of hope has appeared. A few years ago, California passed a proposition which rivaled and surpasses Lexington, Concord and the shot heard around the world. Property taxes were drastically cut by a popular ballot initiative measure. The measure caught on in various states, but it wasn't enough and the impetus is now faltering and waning. The choice is a clear one. Increasing the tax burden leads to economic decay and social revolution. Cutting taxes dramatically and ruthlessly can lead to a rebirth of freedom. Taxation, like cancer, can sometimes require drastic surgery. Are we ready for it? Yo, ready for this? <coughs> Oh, the government can. Woohoo, the government can. The government can destroy. All right, where are we? Okay, <clears throat> let's try another one. First things first. Six. Who's protecting us? In an article in New York Magazine, May the 25th, 1981, Edward N. Kosnikan, Kostkin, Kostkayan, Edward N. Kostkayan, what kind of a name is that? Edward N. Kostakayan and Maxwell Lemon called attention to an ugly fact. It has become a platitude, bitterly true, that people are afraid that the streets have been taken over by muggers. The police can't protect the residents, although that duty is the first obligation of government. Our neighbourhoods could help themselves. It. This is a grim... 
you lost my place. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Don't forget about it. This is a grim and ugly fact. If two men who are involved in politics tell us that our civil government is no longer able to meet its first obligation to protect the people, then we really are in trouble. There is no question that civil government today is trying to do everything under the sun and doing nothing at all successfully. In terms of efficiency and effectiveness, the only thing that civil government does at all well is to take money away from us. Having said this, we must add that the fault is by no means entirely on the side of civil authorities. Lawlessness is so widespread and extensive that it is becoming impossible to control. I can still recall the whining of one man at a neighbourhood meeting about how the police were not doing their job. The fact was that his boys were the neighbourhood menace. We have no right to complain about the failures of the police if we are creating a part of their problem by failing to train our children properly. The church has always been the main force for law enforcement. By the religious and moral instruction it gives, the church has been America's greatest law enforcement agency. I'll try again, this time using my lips. Hello? The church has been America's greatest law enforcement agency. This, however, is not now true of many churches. Neither sound doctrine nor sound morals seem to be present in many Sunday school lessons and pulpit expositions. To teach Sunday school children about American Indian cultures as aspirations... the heck to teach Sunday school children about American Indian cultures and aspirations and nothing about the Ten Commandments is hardly sound teaching of morality instead of being a moral force in the community such churches become a disintegrating force and the children are robbed of the moral discipline and faith they so greatly need Moreover, government, like charity, begins at home. The failure of the family to discipline its children is a key contributing factor to our moral decline. Today, government is indeed failing to protect its citizens, but the failure begins at more basic levels than the police. It represents the moral failure of the churches, families and individuals of our country, Whatever else an election night might do. Ah, just made that up. Whatever else an election might do, and whoever we may vote in, we cannot alter or erase the moral failure. It begins where we live. The remedy also begins there. Dry tickle throat. Tickle. Fumage. 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 Fumé. Fumage. Je suis en train de fumer. Je fume pas. Je fume. Je fume pas. Moi, je fume pas. Merci. Mais non, je fume pas. Fumage. Okay, uh, so thanks for tuning in to the Booth of Truth. Always a pleasure, never a chore. And uh, yeah, the project that we're involved in here is the complete recording of all of Rush Dunny's. Uh, hang on a second, that's not right. What? What is that? Hmm. Can't be right. Published works. That's not right. Uh, 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 yeah, in audiobook format. So if you want to help with the work, you can like, share, comment, make suggestions, whatever. And if you want to help me do more better work, you can make a tax-free, if you're in the US and Canada, tax 
a deductible donation at nathanteacher.com forward slash donations. So thank you very much and see you soon.